Bojo, welcome to Wa Citizen Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is MEL 3E, Grade 11 Workplace Math, and I'm the teacher Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live, you can call the WAS studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM and also on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available for me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled Monday through Thursday from 9 till 10 in the morning, and we are wrapping up our fifth week of our nine-week course. Next week, we will not be broadcasting on Monday, as it is Thanksgiving here in Ontario, so we just won't have class. We will resume class on Tuesday, October the 11th. All right, so we are halfway through our course. You should be submitting work for marking at this point. So a reminder that the support questions, the ones with the little pencil icon, are not for marking. These are practice problems. So you can decide which ones and how many to do. Totally do them all if you want to do them all. But if it's frustrating you that you've got a concept and you don't want to do them all, then you can totally skip questions too if that's what feels best for you. You know you're learning the best. Also, if you need more practice than what you have, let me know and I can send you more practice. The key questions, however, the ones with the little key icon, these ones are the ones you submit for marking. So please do all of these questions. You need to show all of your work, all of your steps, your thinking. This way I can give you credit for all of your understanding. If you only give me the final answer and it's wrong, there's no way for me to understand what it is that you are struggling with, what is you're making a mistake with. Are you making a mistake with a small error like multiplying integers is something that people make a mistake with all the time but that's not one of the new concepts that we're dealing with in your course so if i can see your work then i can understand what it is that uh, you're struggling with so please show me all of your work all right so then how do you actually submit your work there's three methods the first method is to scan your work and send it electronically so if you have a device, you can scan your completed work using it. Apple devices have a notes app that has a free scan function and Android devices, which is, has a free Google Drive app, which also has a scan function. Both these functions are fairly straightforward to use. Basically just point and click. But if you're struggling with that, feel free to reach out and I can walk you through it or uh, if you can't do it, you don't have access to those devices or those apps, and you want to just take pictures of your work and send me those, that's fine too. Scanning just makes the files slightly smaller and easier for me to deal with, but it's no big deal if you need to send pictures. Then you can send it to me through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can also send it to me through Facebook Messenger, where my name is B. Slate Waza. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout if you are here. We have an outdoor mailbox at our 74 Front Street location. We're the bright red building next to the post office, and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance, so you can drop it in there at any time. We are not yet open to the public. Hopefully soon. Hopefully it's coming. But for now, just put your work in that mailbox, and I'll get it back to you as soon as I can. The third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. Students are also welcome to fax the work in if you have access to a fax machine. So that's how you submit your work, but also connecting with me in terms of if you need some support or if you're struggling, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Social media is a great way to connect with me. Both my Facebook profile and my YouTube channel have are under the name B Slate Wassa. So you can friend me on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And then you get notifications every time I upload a video. So all of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and I upload them shortly after their airing to YouTube and I share them on Facebook. So that's a really easy way to access the replays of our videos. And also I have other uh, videos 
generally really short videos that explain common errors or confusing concepts, things that folks struggle with. So if you are having a hard time with something, if you're making the same error over and over again, it's a really good place to go to start your learning if you can't connect with me directly, or even just because uh, being able to see it visually is really helpful, um, opposed to just we can talk or I can text, we can text through Messenger. Um, but being able to see the process can be really helpful. So going to my YouTube channel, I might be addressing the concept already. I am consistently adding videos when I have time, but if there's anything that you would like me to talk about or put a video up for it, let me know and I'm happy to, to do that. Math is a really visual subject, so connecting with my videos is really gonna set you up for the most success. Just listening to me talk is gonna only give you a small part of what it, the understanding, being able to see how I organize my information, how I lay things out is really makes connections that are strong, strong connections that really help your brain make sense of what it is that we're doing. So if you can't join me live through the Zoom time and you can't access the YouTube videos to replay on your own time, then let me know and I can send you a copy of the videos so that you have them for whenever and you need them and if you don't have internet access. If you have any questions or concerns, always contact me, always reach out. I'm here to help. This is this is the, what I do. So please reach out. You're not wasting my time. You're not taking up my time. This is what I'm here to do. You can email me at bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. You could send me a Facebook message at vslatewasa. You could call me on the phone at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., but I am happy to connect outside of that time if we can arrange it priorly. Let's make something that works for everybody. All right, so we are on to lesson 13, uh, which is driver's licenses as insurance. So we've kind of, we're switching gears a little bit. We've been talking a lot about interest rates and loans and borrowing money and investing money. And now we're kind of wrapping up that time. And now we're moving into driver's licenses and insurance. And then we're going to be looking into uh, buying vehicles and uh, other household uh, ways of financially understanding the world. So our learning goals for today is at the end of this lesson, you understand the procedures in Ontario for the graduating licensing system. You'll be able to calculate the costs of speeding tickets, including demerit points, and you'll understand the costs, privileges, and restrictions in obtaining an Ontario driver's license. So you know you've met these learning goals because you can explain the steps involved in getting a full license in Ontario. You can calculate demerit points, fees, and surcharges for various tra traffic violations, and you can explain why insurance is necessary and how rates can be increased or lowered. All right, so when will you use this in real life? Well, we are learning to be informed members of our communities. Many of us have driver's license, many of us drive vehicles and don't necessarily know all the rules of the road or all of the, the consequences of our actions. So speeding might feel like, oh, I'm just, just going a little bit faster. It's not like everybody goes 180 zones. So if I go 110, it's just a little bit faster, whatever. Um, so knowing the consequences of those ac actions beyond being unsafe, uh, is part of what we're learning today so that we can be informed, we can know how these systems work in order to use them effectively and respectfully. But first, let's activate our brain with some mental math. I don't like mad math minutes. They stress folks out, they don't teach skills, they just are time suck, so we don't do those. We look at developing strategies that we can use in various situations that help us understand the numbers and feel comfortable with them. Today's question is 83 take away 29 and we are adding up. So with subtraction, many people have a hard time going backwards. So adding up is when we start with our lower number and we go up. You can think about this on a number line or just numbers. We're going to start at 29 and we are going to go up. So I'm going to add one to get me to 30. And now I'm trying to get all the way up to 
83. So then if I add, I know if I add 50, I'm gonna add a nice big chunk that I know that's gonna get me up to 80. Okay, so I'm almost there. I need to add three more and that gives me up to 83. So I can see that it takes, if I look at it, it takes me 54 steps to go from 29 to 83. That means that 83 take away 29 is equal to 54. This is very similar to what we were doing when we were adding, uh, counting up for making change using coins and bills. Um, it's the same basic principle, but we aren't limited by what the coin denominations are. So we can do whatever we want, um, but it's the same concept and it can be used with any sub subtraction questions that you are in contact with. All right, what prior learning do we know, need to know? I just wanted to give some Ontario driving statistics to see, to give some context about what it's like to drive in our province. So texting and driving accidents, generally texting increases crash risk 23 times. In Ontario, deaths from collisions caused by distracted driving have doubled since 2000. One person is injured in a distracted driving collision every half hour. That's a lot. Driving fatalities in Ontario, this is from 2017, so it's about five years old, but it's the statistics I was able to find the most recent ones. There have been, in that year, there were 617 traffic fatalities, so traffic deaths in, on Ontario roads. 114 pedestrians were killed in traffic accidents. 175 motorcyclists were killed in crashes and 133 people were killed in collisions involving a drunk driver. So there's lots of things that are going on in our communities that potentially could be avoided and deaths that we could not having to have. So collisions by age by drunk vehicle operator, we have a graph here on my chart to show just in terms of how old people are when and they're driving intoxicated. This is probably talking specifically to alcohol intox intoxication, but also recognize that if you are driving high, if you, even though marijuana is legal now, and that's a different conversation, um, but being intoxicated, smoking and driving high is still intoxication. So these stats and things are gonna be changing the way that they're gonna, the information they're sharing in terms of including that within um, these stats because you're still, your mind is altered when you're high and you it's not safe to operate a, mo uh, a vehicle, it's not safe. Anyway, for this graph, the collisions by age of drunk vehicle operators. So you can see on this graph that the highest point is for people between the ages of 25 to 34. These are the folks that are most, uh, more likely to drive when they are drunk. Almost 600 people for when this data was collected were, who were drunk were between the ages of 25 and 34. And then it goes down um, to the age as like, so the next biggest ones are the age range from 21 to 34, then from 35 to 44. And then it just gets smaller and smaller as you get younger. This just goes down to 16 to 20 on the younger side because we're only talking about legal drivers. And then all the way up to uh, 75 and over. Um, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the older you are, the less likely you are to drive drunk. And But the younger groups are the ones who are most, this is under 35. So um, are the people who are more likely to think that it's okay to drive while drunk. So just things to be paying attention to in terms of why all of these rules are in place and why it's really important to be safe in vehicles. All right, what is new? What is our active, our new concepts, our active learning? So this is on page 18 of your aisle booklet. And these are how Ontario driver's licenses are uh, given out. 
or earned. There we go. As of April 1st, 1994, all new drivers applying for their first car or motorcycle license enter Ontario's graduated licensing system. The graduating license system lets new drivers get driving experience and skills gradually. So it used to be that you had, they called it your 365 and you had it for a year and then you could have your full license. But as of April 1st, 1999, so this is quite a while ago now, uh, it takes a longer process. There's multiple steps um, in order to make sure that we are licensing people safely. So the two-step licensing process takes at least 20 months to complete, but you have a total of five years. So the first step is the class G1. So a new driver must hold a G1 license for a minimum of 12 months before attempting the G1 road test. This time can be reduced to eight months if the new driver successfully completes an approved driver education course. So if you take driver's ed and you complete it, you pass it, then you can get your, you can finish your, you can do your road test at eight months instead of at a year. So then you move into class two G2, if you pass your G1 road test. And then, so at that point you need to hold your G2 license for a minimum of 12 months before you can attempt your G2 road test. So you have to have that G2 license for a year before you are allowed to get your full license. So what does it mean to have your class G1? So as your G1 driver, you're required to maintain a zero blood alcohol level while driving. You are not allowed to have any alcohol in your system. You must be accompanied by a fully licensed driver who's had their license for at least four years, their full license. You need to ensure the number of passengers in the vehicle is limited to the number of working seatbelts. You can't have extra people. Everybody has to be in a working seatbelt. You have to refrain from driving between midnight and 5 a.m. And you have to refrain from driving Ontario's 400 series highways or on high speed expressways, things where the speed limit is 90 kilometers an hour or more and have multiple lanes. This is only if you are, uh, you can only do this if you are driving with a fully licensed uh, driving instructor then you are allowed to drive, you're allowed to practice on these lanes, on these highways. So a class two license, so this is on page 19 of your app booklet, you're required to maintain a zero blood alcohol level while driving, that's still the same. Ensure the number of passengers in the vehicle is still limited to the number of working seat belts, that is still the same. But you may drive without the accompanying driver on all Ontario roads at any time. So you don't have to have a fully licensed driver in your vehicle. You can go on those big highways and you can drive in the middle of the night. So a class G license is required if you plan on driving a car, van, or small truck. So there's other licenses for like a motorcycle or for a transfer truck, bigger truck. Those are different. But you have to have this license before you can drive any other vehicle. So you have to get a class G license. This is your general license. Everybody has to have it before they can learn how to drive anything else. In order to apply for your class G license, in order to start this graduated licensing process, you need to be at least 16 years old. You must meet the vision standards established by the Ministry of Transportation. Let's take an eye test to make sure you can see well. You can still wear glasses, but then you need to take the eye test with your glasses on. There's different, then you have to, then you have to drive with your glasses on. You must pass a knowledge test regarding the rules of road, of the road and the signs. And then you must pass two road tests to become fully licensed. So to get your G1, you have to pass that written test where you have a, it's a multiple choice questions, 20 questions that ask you about the rules of the road and then 20 questions that ask you about the different signs. And then after those timelines that we talked about before, then you take road tests, two road tests where you were with a test a driving tester and they decide if you're driving safely or not. There's various things you have to be able to do. So here is a little diagram that shows you how, all the steps again. So showing your, to start with, you write a test. For start, you turn 16, but 
or I guess you can study for the written test, turn 16, and then you go and you apply for your license at a driver test center. Then you take a test, a vision test at that drive test center. You obtain your temporary driver's license. Sorry, no, this is, I was like, that doesn't make sense. Following the arrows, not. Sorry, you pay the fees. There's a fee we'll talk about. And you complete the, and pass the written knowledge test. Then you get your temporary license and you can practice your driving with a class G, sorry, you can practice driving with your license and accompanied by a fully licensed driver. After eight to 12 months, you book your road test and you take a road test. You have to provide the vehicle to do that, just so you know. Then you practice, if you pass that, you practice driving with your class G2 license. And then you book a road test and take your class G road test. Again, you need your own vehicle. And then if you pass that, then you have your full license and you don't need to be, you don't have to take any more road tests until, um, unless there's, um, unless by some reason the law says that you have to, or as you get older, there's rules once you get older to make sure you're still a safe driver. So things to know about this, the vision test takes a few minutes. If you need corrective lenses, either contact lenses or glasses, take them, have them with you. There is a fee that's involved and it can be paid by cash or credit or debit card, or possibly a certified check or money order. Um, just be aware of where you're going, what the rules are. The temporary driver's license is made of paper and it's valid for 90 days as they mail you a official plastic license. The knowledge test takes approximately 30 minutes and generally no appointment is required. This again, check in terms of your local, where you're going for your testing center. Their rules might be different, particularly with COVID um, as things have changed since COVID-19. So it's just good to touch base first to make sure that you're able to just walk in and do your test. Once you have your G1 license, again, these are super important. So I'm saying them again. You must maintain a zero blood alcohol level, no alcohol. You also, this also means that you cannot be smoking high or sorry, driving after smoking and being high. Uh, every passenger has to have a seatbelt. You can not drive between midnight and 5 a.m. You cannot drive on big highways. The fully licensed driver with at least four years of experience has to be with you and their blood alcohol has to be less than 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.05%. And if you are under 21, and so if the person who is driving with you is under is 21 and under, their blood alcohol must be zero. If you are unsuccessful in your tests, you can try the road test again, as long as your, your license hasn't expired. So that's just good to know is that it's okay to fail, that happens, and you can take your test again. So then just a little bit about the fees. I'm not gonna talk about all of these. You can look this up if you're interested, but in order to get your, if you're applying for your G1 license package, this, you pay a fee of $159.75 is what it was the last time I looked it up. Um, and this means this covers the cost of your knowledge test as well as your class G2 row test. So your row test to earn your G2 and your five-year license. So you have to pay this to start and it covers all of those things until you have to pay again to do your road test, your final road test um, to earn your G license. There's a cost of $91.25 for that uh, license. If you need to do extra attempts at things, then there's other costs, but those are the two main uh, costs. All right, so that's getting your actual license. So great, you have your actual license. Now let's talk about demerit points. So this is on page also 19 of your book. So demerit points are for monitoring your driving. All individuals who drive a vehicle in Ontario are subject to this system only when they are convicted of an offense under the Highway Traffic Act. So there's, there's a law specifically about the Highway Traffic Act and demerit points are part of that system. 
demerit points are added, so you collect demerit points. You don't lose them. You're not you're not starting with ten and losing them. You are starting with zero and you add them. And this happens if you are found guilty of a traffic ticket offense. The amount of points you gain vary per charge. And if you obtain too many demerit points, there is the possibility that you could lose your license. So you start with zero points and you go up to 15 points. Hopefully you don't, but you can go up to 15 points. A demerit point will stay on your record for a maximum of two years from the offense date. Once two years has passed, they automatically are removed from your record. So if you don't get any more points, then they get wiped away. Don't assume that if the demerit points are not written on a ticket, that there's no points associated with the charge. Tickets aren't necessarily clear. So how demerit points are applied. So if you are not a fully licensed driver, either you have your G1 or your G2, you get two to five demerit points. If you have that many demerit points, you get a warning letter. You get mailed a warning letter and you most likely will have to attend an interview hearing. So something where you have a conversation with someone. If you get six to eight demerit points, your license could be suspended. So this is if you're a new driver, a G1, G2 driver, and you're already, you are, not following the rules of the road, then you can get your license suspended at only six points. You might get a 30-day license suspension, and this is if you are convicted of four or more demerit point traffic tickets, or you're convicted of a graduated licensing requirement. So you have more people in your vehicle than working seatbelts, you have alcohol in your system, you're driving in the middle of the night, things like that. If you get, you might get a 60 day license suspension if you receive nine or more demerit points. Okay, so that's if you're a learning driver, but if you are a, license, a fully licensed driver, so you have your full lead G license. So two to eight demerit points, this is when you get sent a warning letter. 19 to 14 demerit points, this is when your license could be suspended. So you may, at this point, you may have to attend an interview to discuss your record. If you have 15 or more demerit points, you are given a 30 day license suspension. And so that's how it works. So in your booklet, it has the whole list, I believe, of all the demerit points. I'm not gonna walk through all of them, but just gonna talk through the, the ones that are the biggest um, in terms of the most demerit points, because you, you aren't always just earning one. So if you fail to remain at the scene of a collision, that is seven demerit points. If you fail to stop when signaled or asked by a police officer, that is seven demerit points. Then if you have things that are six demerit points are things that fall under the category of careless driving, stunt driving, failing to stop for a school bus, or exceeding the speed limit by 50 kilometers an hour or more. Then things that are four demerit points are exceeding the speed limit by 30 to 49 kilometers an hour, or if you're following too closely, you're not giving people enough safe stopping space. And then it continues. Um, the rest are all three. The next portion, these are all three. And these are things like speeding between 16 to 29 kilometers an hour, uh, driving while holding or using a handheld wireless communication device. So that is talking on the phone or texting, uh, driving the wrong way on a divided highway, failing to yield the right of way or stopping at a stop sign. failing to obey the directions of a police officer or to report a collision, failing to slow and carefully pass a stopped emergency vehicle or tow truck when its amber lights are flashing, not passing properly, crowding the driver's seat, putting too much stuff in the driver's seat, which probably includes animals. I've seen many people driving with dogs or cats in their laps and that always stresses me out. Anyway, there's various other ones. Those are a few of them that will get you three demerit points. And then to get two demerit points are improper right and left turns, not opening your improper opening of a vehicle door. This is probably like if you aren't looking and you open a door in front of traffic and there's a bike or something there that's bashed into you. Towing persons on toboggans, bicycles, or skis, don't do that. Unnecessary slow driving. So it's not great to drive too fast, but it's also not great to drive too slow. You're impeding the flow of traffic. That's not okay. Failing to lower your high headlamps, your high beams, or obeying signs, not stopping at a crosswalk, not signaling. People don't signal all the time, but it, that is two demerit points. 
uh, failing to ensure an infant or child passenger is possibly secured or anybody not wearing their seatbelt. So those are just, those are all the different things for the merit points. But in terms of speeding, you get, there's a couple of different things that happen with speeding. So as it, we did mention before, if you're speeding between zero and 15 kilometers an hour, you don't get any, it's zero demerit points, but we're gonna talk about, there's still a ticket and there's still a fine that goes with it, but these are demerit points. If you are going 16 to 29 kilometers over the speed limit, it's three demerit points, 30 to 49 kilometers over the speed limit, it's four demerit points plus a 30 day suspension, suspension if you are a G1, G2 driver. 50 kilometers over the speed limit, it's a six demerit points and a 30 day suspension for G1, G2 drivers. And if you're doing any stunt driving or racing, this is six demerit points, a seven day license suspension, seven day vehicle impound, a minimum fine of $2,000, a maximum fine of $10,000, a maximum two year license suspension and maximum six month jail time. So not safe, don't do those things. This is why it's, it's really unsafe, why there's this heavy uh, penalties. So also with speeding tickets, you have the demerit points, but then you also get fines. So for how it works is that it's per kilometer per hour. So however much you are driving over the speed limit, you're gonna get a certain amount of fine per each kilometer. So if it's one to 19 kilometers over the speed limit, you get $2.50 per kilometer an hour that you're over the limit. If you're between 20 and 34, kilometers an hour over the limit, then it's $3.75 per kilometer an hour that you're over. If it's between 35 and 49, then it's $6 per kilometer an hour that you're over. And if it's 50 or more, then here it just says a minimum fine of $7,000 and a possible seizure of your vehicle. If you are speeding in a community safety zone, so here's the sign that says community safety zone and it will say fines are increased. So this is like school zone, play, where this is where like playgrounds are, residential areas, places that are likely to have children or people around, then the fines are increased. So now the fine is doubled. So between one kilometer an hour, 19 kilometers an hour over, it's $5. Between 20 and 34, it's $7.50 per kilometer an hour. Um, between over 35, there's no out of court settlement. You have to go to court and they go from there. So if you're speeding way too much, then you have to go to court. Then on top of that, there is the victim fine surcharge. So this is an extra fine that a judge can order as part of your sentence. You may have to pay the victim fine surcharge, even if you have to pay another fine or as part of your sentence. So those fines, those speeding fines that we just talked about, are one thing, and then on top of that, you might have to pay a victim fine surcharge. These also, the victim fine surcharge could be added to any of those other charges that we talked about in terms of demerit points. This could be included as well. It doesn't matter whether you were convicted, got an absolute discharge or conditional discharge as your sentence, you may still have to pay the victim fine surcharge. So you might be cleared of everything else, but they might still fine you this, this fee. If a judge orders you to pay the victim fine surcharge, you're given a form called a notice of fine and due date as your, at your sentencing. The form says the amount of your victim fine surcharge, which depends on the situation, how you can pay it, when you have to pay it by, and how you can ask for more time to pay it. So who are the people, when are you gonna have to do this? So this really has changed and the rules really apply to different things. It depends on the date on which you're, you committed your crime and you were sentenced. And so it's something you have to just sort of pay close attention to. So generally how it's added. So for one thing, it's added to every speed fine. So when you're doing your problems in your book, if you're doing, if you're checking, if you are calculating what your fine will be, if you are speeding, you have to add the victim fine surcharge on top of it. So this fee, what it does is that it funds victim justice funds. So it helps people who are victims of crime. That's where this money goes. So if you're fine, so you have to calculate your fine first, if you're speeding, you calculate your fine. And if it falls in, where it falls in this category tells you how much more you add. So if your fine is between zero and $50, then you add another $10 on top. If your fine is between 201 and $250, then you add another $50 on top. So you just need to go through and look at this chart. Again, I have no expectation that you're gonna memorize this. I do not have this memorized, 
you're going to look up to see how much your fine is and then you look at the chart to see what the extra surcharge is if your fine is over a thousand dollars then you get 25 percent of whatever the fine is and that's added as the surcharge all right so let's look at this example Calculate the cost of speeding fines and the number of demerit points when speeding by 42 kilometers per hour. So this is where 42 kilometers per hour means that this is the uh, amount that we are over. So to calculate our fine, that means that 42 kilometers per hour we have to look, we say, okay, where's 42? Okay, 42 is in this 35 to 49 area range. So we do 42 times $6 is equal to 42 times six is equal to $252. So $252. Then it also asks you the number of demerit points and because we are speeding, we have to also do the victim surcharge fine. So you're gonna have to look up these things. You don't necessarily have them all memorized. So if I go back to the victim first surcharge fine, I said it was 252. So that falls in the 251 to 300 category. So I have to pay an extra $60 on top. So the cost, the fine is gonna be $312, because I'm adding those two together. Then the number of DeBear points we have to look that up too. I don't have it memorized. I have to go back. It was 42 kilometers an hour. So that is in this range. So that's four DeMare points. So that's four demerit points. So you need all of these different pieces of information to answer these questions. In example two, if you are speeding in a community safety zone, what are you gonna be your fines and your demerit points? We're speeding by 25 kilometers an hour in that zone. So 25 kilometers an hour is here. So that means it's gonna be $7.50 for every kilometer an hour. So $7.50. We're going to times by 25. 25 times $7.50. So that's $187.50. So then we have to look at the victim surcharge. So that was 187. So that's between 151 and 200. So that's another surcharge of $35. Oops. So then the total cost is 187 plus 35, 2750 plus $35 is $222.50. Oops. That's how much the total cost is gonna be. And then you have to look up the demerit points. And again, I have to go all the way back because I don't have it memorized. So it was 25 kilometers an hour. So that's going to be three demerit points. Three demerit points. So you have to do both those things. All right, so now you should be able to answer the support questions on page 23 to 24, questions one through four. Remember to do include both the speeding costs and the victim surcharges, and then looking at the demerit points too. There's lots of parts. All right, so then the next piece we're gonna talk about is insuring your car. So this is on page 24 of your booklet. So insurance is important because having a driver's license is only one step on the way to owning and operating a vehicle. It has many risks and even the best drivers get into accidents. So by law, the owner of a car is required to insure the car. Failure to have insurance can result in a large fine and going to court. This is different in different places in the world. In Ontario, you have to have insurance.
every insurance policy must include the following, a third party liability coverage with a $200,000 minimum in case someone else is killed or injured or the property is damaged as a result of car accident you were in. A statutory accident benefit coverage provides you with benefits if you were injured in an accident, even if you were at fault. Direct compensation and property damage coverage for any damage to your vehicle and possessions inside it if you are in an accident and someone else is in at fault. So it really protects you. Then finally, uninsured automotive coverage if you and your family, for you and your family, if you are injured or killed in a vehicle that is uninsured or flees the scene before their identity can be determined. So this is that you're insured to be covered in case someone else isn't insured or they run away and they don't take responsibility for their actions so that you still get the support that you need. So how does it, what does it, what are the costs related to car insurance? So this, all the cost depends on different things. It depends on your driving experience. So how long you've been driving in Canada, the longer you've been driving in Canada, the less it's gonna cost you. Your record in other countries are not counted. So it's just a Canadian experience. Your driving history. So how many accidents or speeding tickets you have. Your age, the older you are, the lower your rates are in general. Your gender, women typically get lower rates than men. We won't go there. Uh, your location, there are more accidents in crowded cities like Toronto than in smaller towns. So if you live in a smaller town, you're gonna have a lower cost of car insurance. The actual vehicle that you're insuring, cars that are cheaper and have higher safety ratings do not cost as much to insure than expensive cars or cars that have lower safety ratings. Your vehicle usage. So if you are driving more, you have a higher chance of an accident and therefore pay higher insurance. If you have winter tires, there's a new Ontario law allows for drivers to get insurance discount for using winter tires during the snowy season. So if you change, if you invest in winter tires and you change them, I think it's from November to April. I don't know exactly, but I think that's what it is. Um, then your insurance is lower because you are taking steps to be safer. Ontario has the highest average insurance rates in Canada out of any other province. Ontario mandates better standard coverage and accident benefit laws. So the extra cost at least has extra benefits as well. So the reason that we have higher insurance rates is because that we're covered by more things to make sure we are safer. So when will your insurance rates be reduced? So getting a higher driver's license level or completing a driver's course, if you are a new driver. Being older while also keeping a clean driving record. So having not having any accidents or speeding tickets as you get older. Changing your policy deductible or level of coverage to something cheaper. So looking at your policy and seeing what makes the most sense for you, but also making sure you're covering for what you need. Moving to a safer area, somewhere with more secure parking or out of a bigger city to a smaller town. If just time passes and old accidents or tickets fall off of your record, then your rate might be improved. Uh, you can shop around at another company who offers cheaper rates. So something to know is that fines for being caught driving a car without a valid car insurance policy range between $5,000 and $50,000. And you can also have your license suspended or car impounded. If you cause an accident without proper insurance, you have to pay legal and medical costs. I know that it feels it's really difficult with uh, gas prices increasing and just the cost of living increasing that feels sometimes like car insurance is something that you could just not pay and hope for the best but there are severe consequences if if you do get an accident um, and you're not insured all right so looking look at this example a family's car insurance premium is one thousand nine hundred and twenty dollars a year adding a driver will cost 45 percent more how much is the total cost of insuring the vehicle now so what we need to do is we just need to, similar to when we've been buying something and we're adding the tax, we are buying, we are, we have a regular cost of 1,920 and we need to increase it by 45%. So first we need to figure out what 45% is. So we're gonna do 1,920 times 0 0.45. And that is, $864 
So adding this driver means that in a year they need to add, they're gonna increase their premium by $864. So you have that $1,920 plus 864 is equal to, add them together, 2,784. So that's what the new, the total cost of insuring that vehicle is now that you have more drivers. So now you can do the support questions on page 25, question number five. So let's consolidate what we've learned today. So this is lesson 13. And we first talked about the graduated licensing system and how you get your G1 and your G2, what the steps are to get those and what the restrictions are for those particular licenses. Then we talked about your the demerit points and that they're added up. You have a, a tracking system that they track in terms of you get added if you're found guilty of a traffic ticket offense and it's up to 15 points. Uh, it really varies per charge. Remember that big long list of various things and it can lead to a possible license suspension. We also talked about speeding tickets and that they have demerit points applied. You get demerit points even if you get if you get a speeding ticket. And you also have fees and surcharges that you have to pay if you get a speeding ticket. So there's lots of things that go on with speeding tickets. Don't speed. And then you don't have to worry about these things. Speeding, the reason there's so many things about this is because speeding is super dangerous and you just can't stop your vehicle. We're gonna talk about this more later in a later lesson, but you just can't stop your vehicle as quickly if a moose shows up in the middle of the road or if someone else spins out on ice or something ends up in your lane. You just can't stop as fast. So it's really important to be really careful and drive the speed limit or close to the speed limit. Then we talked about car insurance and how premiums raise or lower depending on your situation. So really thinking hard about what it is about that makes that's added to your uh, or contributes to your insurance. And then what, uh, how you can change that, how you can get a lower insurance if that's something that you are interested in doing. Also a reminder that insurance, car insurance is mandatory. You must have it in Ontario. I know it sucks put money out there but it protects you so much if you end up in an accident even if it's not your fault even if it is your fault if you end up in an accident that moose gets in the road that other person spins out you spin out having car insurance is going to help you so much so it means that you don't have to take out those payday loans because all of a sudden you need all this money to fix your vehicle or to pay for medical expenses it's really important to have car insurance, it'll help you out if you're in a bad situation. So our success criteria are that you can explain the steps involved in getting a full license in Ontario. You can calculate demerit points, fees and surcharges for various traffic violations. We focused on speeding tickets, but remember the demerit points we looked at for various different traffic violations and then the fees and the surcharges, we looked specifically at speeding tickets. And then you can explain why insurance, insurance is necessary and how rates can be increased or lowered. I didn't give you any exact numbers in terms of this is what your insurance rate is gonna be um, because I have no idea. It changes and it's really dependent upon the situation and dependent upon the, the climate of the economy and just what different businesses are offering. So those general things about what we talked about in terms of how, what is included in consideration when you're getting your insurance, those things are standard, but the actual numbers consistently change. All right, and that is lesson 13. So please, if you have any questions about this lesson, this lesson wasn't necessarily as math heavy as our previous lessons have been uh, in terms of calculations and numbers, but it's still a lot of really important information and understanding the bigger concept and context is, is still really important. So give me a call if you have any questions at 807-737-1488, extension 2209. You can also call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. Send me an email at bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E. 
at edmec.on.ca. Connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa or go check out my YouTube channel, which is also called bslatewasa to get the replay of this video as well as all of our other lessons uh, so far this year. Um, it's all under a playlist called MEL3E. There are also archives from when I've recorded this in previous years, so you can look there too if you're interested in checking those ones out. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. So please reach out to me during those times if you want to talk to me directly or send me a message and we can set up a time that works for both of us if you need to connect with me outside of those hours. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day and a lovely Thanksgiving weekend. We will see you next or talk to you next Tuesday. Which.